Hello, and welcome to the Professor Podcast with Ruth and Claire. Each episode, we talk about a particular topic in the life of a professor. We are tenure-track faculty members in the sciences, working at a primarily undergraduate university in California. The purpose of our podcast is reflection, so we bring something we think is working and something we're working on to discuss. Welcome to the Professor Podcast with Ruth and Claire. I'm Claire. And I'm Ruth, and today we're talking about life outside being a professor. But before we do that, Claire, tell me, how was your week? My week was good. Uh, One thing I wanted to report was I was inspired to reread one of my all-time favorite books, which is Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wynne-Jones. Oh, I didn't know that was a book. Oh, yes. Oh, wow. It's it's also a movie. Um, But yes, it's fantastic. You know, you've got magic and wizards and parallel worlds, and uh, it's just top it's got fairy all tale the stuff yeah it's, perfect I, i'm just so into it so i've really been enjoying that and i've been noticing all these things like i've read that book a lot but i just read the description of the castle howl's moving castle and i was thinking gosh i had no idea it looked like that so um you see new things every time so it's it's fun to reread dude i am so into rereading books like i always have been like sometimes, especially when I used to be really into detective books, I would just uh-huh. finish it and immediately start it again because I'd be like, oh, what would it be like now that I know these other right. things? Like, how will that change it? What clues will you pick up? Yeah. Yeah. And at the moment, I think it's some of my response to world stress and mm-hmm. I can't ho- cope with any surprises. So I'm only rereading books. Reread. Yeah. yeah. Totally. And, that makes but sense. still, they can still, like I reread one by Margaret Atwood. Oh, yeah. The Blind Assassin. Well, those which, are tough. Oh, man. She messes with your noodle like in a big way, like and she's they're so good. But oh wow, yeah, yeah. There's some of her books I would never. There's one called Cat's Eye, which uh-huh. was so traumatic. It was sort of about mean kids, like mean girls, mm. and I will never read that book again. It was way too immersive. You it know what's coming, intense. and you don't want it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, even with even knowing, yeah. So how was your week? Oh, my week was, it was good. Um, It's very interesting to me how much I don't want to prepare for my classes that I would rather work on my tenure file. It's like, oh, oh there wow. is something that I would rather, like tenure file is better than something. So that's something. <laughs> You're seeing your, your priority list in, yeah. uh, in your, yeah, what you want to work on list. Yeah. <laughs> and we, um, we did a giant jigsaw puzzle Ooh, recently. And fun. I haven't done that in a long time. And I forgot how... Like, it's so absorbing. Like, even the yeah. kids, like, suddenly we were like, whoa, an hour and a half has just gone by. And that doesn't <laughs> happen very often with the kids. So that was super cool. I love jigsaw puzzles. I love how you become so in tune to the various shades of colors. Yeah. You're like, oh, this is definitely not that green. It is this other green, you know? <laughs> yeah, totally. And uh, yeah, because at first it's like, this is all the same color. And then right. as you go on, you're like, oh, nuance. But yeah. I... Years ago, me and my foster sister used to do a lot of puzzles. Uh huh. And we had one just beast of a puzzle that we did, and it took so long. And we finally got to the end, and the last piece was not, it was gone. <laughs> we didn't oh, have no. the last piece. And it was just so frustrating because even though we knew we had done everything we could, yeah. it just wasn't that like satisfaction of finishing the puzzle. So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's my, my sad puzzle history but anyway tell us have you got a quote for this week I do and I'm bringing us back to our roots with Harry Potter again oh wow um, okay yeah so um this is a quote um from Dumbledore and it's when Harry is with him at the mirror of Erised which shows you whatever you desire most and Harry says what do you see when you look in the mirror I I see myself holding a pair of thick woolen socks Harry stared. One can never have enough socks, said Dumbledore. Another Christmas has come and gone, and I didn't get a single pair. People will insist on giving me books. (laughs) (laughs) Which I love that scene. And also, I just thought it was, uh, in terms of life outside of being a professor, Dumbledore wears socks too, and he likes socks. And um, there's things that he does besides read books and uh, be a professor. So I thought that was fun. That is super. And then it's also quite interesting, right? Because he shares that. And that's something that we've talked about before, like sharing your outside interests. Right. You know, and like that can kind of humanize you or, you know, yeah. Totally. 
cool. added nuance with that scene is, of course, we're not sure if that was really what he desired, but at least he was sharing a fun thing about himself, even if it wasn't what he truly saw. But I think that's a good point, too, right? Because it'd be really (laughs) dark if he told this 11-year-old, oh, I want to be reunited with my sister who, you know, died in terror. Yeah, so maybe it's like what's appropriate to share. (laughs) And sometimes it's appropriate to share that you like socks. And then sometimes, yeah, interesting. Wow, we just got a lot out of... That was great. Yeah. Yeah. So tell Um, me. Okay. Yeah. So just an overview of what we were thinking here, at least. Yeah. This is, this is, so obviously every professor does things that are not directly related to being a professor, like wearing socks and and having a family and pursuing hobbies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, So it's almost odd to even mention, but um, I feel like it's a good thing to, to discuss directly here. So. Um, yeah, did you have other thoughts in a little intro here before we get into what's working? Yeah, I think, um, I think you're right that like everybody does have it. And I also think like a lot of people don't talk about it. Right. So, you know, and I think that's a lot of my stuff about working on that I'm going to come to, but I think it's important to name it and be like, yes, it is okay to actually have this outside existence. Totally. Totally. So I, I'm into it. Cool. Okay, so what is working for you with life outside of being a professor? I think um, I think the one big thing for us lately has been this tech Sabbath thing. Ah, yes. Because it's been super helpful. I think before COVID, I love the way everything in my life, in my mind, is like before or after. Like it's, <laughs> you know, that's my new time metric. But we were actually reasonably good about life at home was life at home and life at work was life at work. And then Mm -hmm. obviously that just got totally churned up over the last few months. So the tech Sabbath has been really helpful for resetting that. And it's definitely made me even feel more like it's, there's a week and a weekend, you know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Cause it's like Friday night is when we're going to turn off everything and we're going to go into this time period. And so that's been super helpful I think for me, I um, I get a lot out of like connecting and chatting with people. Mm-hmm. And sometimes like that's uh, like chatting with people in Ireland or chatting with people here, but just stuff to make my world a little bigger than just the minute details of like our class department and being in classes and stuff. Cause that is the more intensely focused I get, you know, where you just feel like everything everything that happens in your classroom determines everything in your whole life when really it's this tiny percentage and I get quite like sometimes I think like as professors we can be quite um self-absorbed like I remember being in our store here the Mm co-op and the person was like asking a question and I answered but it was very like yeah well there's only two more days and two more classes and and then I was like oh wait like this isn't your world like there is actually this whole (laughs) other world that's not running around this like ridiculous academic schedule do you know what I mean and sometimes you just get so absorbed in it it feels like that is the whole world so Uh I think deliberately making my world a little bit bigger by you know talking with people outside of it and then always knitting knitting is my huge source of and even just reading knitting books and knitting Uh magazines is yeah because it feels like the exact opposite I know sometimes I say it is kind of like physics but in other ways, it's just so different, right, to academic stuff. Sure. Because you do a physical thing with a tactile substance and you get a thing. It, like, it's just so different than brain stuff. Totally. So that makes sense. And then, obviously, the kids uh-huh. are a great interrupter of professoring life. Totally. Yeah. So that's good. So tell me, I want to hear yours because you have a bazillion cool things. <laughs> All right. So um, let's see. One thing I wanted to say that's working is sharing some of my non-professor life with students. Um, like we said, oh yeah, humanize my interactions with them and and hopefully model help. for them. And this is normal, yeah. Yeah. So first of all, hopefully it helps me be less of that scary professor at the front of the room, and also, yeah. So uh, and I I think I mentioned the story one other time on the podcast. I had one student who came to one of my my band's shows and specifically said that he to see a faculty member in a band really helped him think that maybe academia was something he wanted to go into. It didn't mean you had to give up everything else and just be a professor. And um, 
so that is really an example of why it's uh, yeah I, I'm really excited that I can share that by sharing some of myself with my students oh yeah um and then yeah designating time for non-professor things um like these bands uh playing music with Ralph in our bands and uh, I've been working on writing a novel Ooh. formerly I wrote a different novel but the draft was horrible and I threw it away and now I'm writing a different novel um you didn't like you did really throw it away right well, I still, that's true. Okay, but it's still, still ex- no, but I was just concerned that you did, because you might revisit it years from now. That's and be true. Like, oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Years from now, maybe I'll be a better writer and I'll be able to figure it out. Yeah, so work-life balance um, to get those things into my life too. And like you, I, I, I found it effective to have really clear, this is work time, this is other time, um, you know, moments in the day. Um. And one thing I wanted to add about that is work-life balance is kind of a phrase I always thought of as meaning don't let work take over your life and defend non-work time. And that's true, but it is a balance the other way too. Um, and like I, last week I kind of went overboard in defending my non-work time and didn't do a lot of work things that I really wanted to do and really had not aligned what I wanted to do with what I was deciding to do. Mm. And interestingly, what I wanted to do was this work thing. Um, So anyway, when I gave in and actually did that work thing, I really enjoyed myself. And so I guess I am mentioning that it's also working to remember why I am a professor and that I do enjoy working to do that well. And so it's not always a fight to spend less time on professor things. It really is a balance with having more than one thing in your life, but also remembering that that work thing is something that I like to do and I'm committed to doing well and spending time on. So Dude, that is crucial because sometimes yeah. I get into this headspace where you're like, ugh, work, and like everything feels like, you know, it's especially with some, like some of the climate at the moment, it just feels so negative, everything about work. And then it is, of course, we want to do it. Like this is right. totally the thing we chose to right. do. And Sometimes it's almost like I don't even remember that. And then when you kind of like step back a little bit and you're like, yeah, I love students. They're great. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's really important to kind of hold that too. Sometimes I end up feeling like it's just a game of spending the less time on it so that I can have my work-life balance. But really it is a balance both ways. So, yeah. Yeah, totally. So what are you working on? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, here, I think... hmm. One thing I'm really working on is sort of shame about it. Okay. And I think one thing that I'm very susceptible to is believing what other people say. Ooh. Do you know what I mean? And so yeah. when you're in an environment where everyone's like, oh man, I was up till two in the morning doing my grading last night. And like, oh, I'm always yeah. the chump who's like, really? Like everyone was studying until midnight last Like I was the exact same at undergrad, right? Just always buy it, whatever mm-hmm. it is. And so... I feel kind of like ashamed sometimes about wanting to like, I don't want to work in my outside time. Do you know what I mean? And like, especially when the kids were little, Mm -hmm. I would never do anything on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Like it was, I just felt so weird that they were already in daycare for so much of the day. Mm -hmm. Then I was like, the weekend belongs to you. And the evening Mm -hmm. time I will lay down with you for an hour and a half if that's what it takes to get you to sleep because I haven't seen you all day and I'm not Mm -hmm. going to sit up all night grading. So I was like weirdly efficient then Mm -hmm. more so than now. Well, that is great. Yeah. Right. And, but I did feel this like sort of secret shame and people would be kind of, I had a very bizarre interaction with someone in an online group where we were talking and I said, oh, one person shared that they were going to start taking one day off a weekend. And I was like, oh, like I don't actually work on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And this guy got really mad and was like, oh, I guess you just expect other people in your department to pick up the slack because Mm -hmm. you have kids. And and it was really, I I think he might have been projecting something about a different situation that was going on in his department or something. But like that definitely was not the case because I actually was like pretty efficient and got stuff done during the week. But it did feel like there was this sort of judgment about, oh, you're not willing to work all day every day Mm -hmm. on this like calling that we have and even with some things like I think I've told you this before like I talk to the students about grad schools and I always say you shouldn't go somewhere you don't want to live for grad school and 
I feel like it's the same with jobs, but sometimes some people have this like, no, like if you care about the profession, you should be willing mm-hmm. to go anywhere. And that's just not true for me at all. And yeah, so I think I struggle with that, like feeling this sort of, like I'm doing something illicit sometimes by, right. you know, so I really appreciate you suggesting this episode and this kind of process of normalizing. Yes, we should all do things outside of work and most people do, you know, like most it's just do. that we don't always talk about it. So, yeah. Yeah. And there's definitely like it's augmented by the general discussion and the culture where it is true that people talk about everyone's always busy and everyone's mm-hmm. always got too many things to do. And I mean that I, I, we all could always be doing an infinite number of things. So that's true, but it's the way that everyone speaks about it. I think reinforces this idea that we all are expected to work until two in the morning every night and on both right. days of the weekend. Yeah. Um, and I've definitely found myself being like, Oh, oh tell me about it. You know, me too, but totally. I, it's not true at all. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. I don't want to do that. Yeah. So, cause it's, it's, it's fun to commiserate to a point, but yeah. And, and who knows some of the people, um, you know, everyone's making choices. Maybe somebody's working a million more hours than us. Maybe they're more efficient than us. Maybe we're more efficient than them. Who knows? The point is we're all deciding to do how we want to do it. And that's all that really matters, you know? Totally. Yeah, I think, like, and I, you know, when I think about it and I'm like, what do I actually want for my family? Yes. Like, of course, this is what I want to do and I don't want to be working all the time and that's crazy. Yes. The kids are only going to be small this one short period of time and you know so it is when I can like actually think about it and recognize it like this is absolutely what I want to do but in the moment sometimes I just feel like oh you know and even with what you were saying about sharing stuff about yourself Mm -hmm. um it's been really important to me to sort of share some stuff about the fact that I have kids because Mm -hmm. when I was an undergrad I would just kind of assumed that it wasn't possible to teach and have kids like that wasn't a thing I'm not totally Mm -hmm. sure it is now but anyway like assuming that it is possible (laughs) like I kind of want to yeah normalize that a little bit and I would have gobbled that up if someone had shared some details about their kids I would have been like what tell me more you know I want to hear about this yeah but then I do worry sometimes that it like discredits me a little bit Mm. do you know what I mean because some people still and I guess it's that thing you can't please everybody but some people so as part of the tenure process, I was going through the dreaded student evals Mm -hmm. to pick out comments to do. And it's just so interesting because say like, I'll have five comments that are like, I love the atmosphere in class. It's so great. And I really appreciate. And then there'll be one person every once in a while who'll say like, I wish it was a less conversational tone Mm -hmm. in the lab or whatever. And I kind of end up going into it like, oh my God, how will I fix things for this person? And it just isn't, it's not possible. You know, totally. so, but I think I worry sometimes that by chatting a bit or sharing things like that, mm-hmm. that you can kind of discredit yourself or have people take you less seriously. Sure. But the yeah. older I get, the more comfortable I get with people not taking me seriously. So I think that's yeah. okay. And like you say, you can't please everybody. Um, and so you, you know, we each have our own classroom the way we think is best to have our classroom. And we each set up our own life and work-life balance the way we, hopefully the way we want to do it yeah and um and that's that's really all there is to it I think you know wouldn't it be a misery if you just spent your whole life subscribing to what someone else thought you should be doing and then you find out no one's been doing this the whole time or this wasn't like a rule that I had to like ignore my kids for six years so I could get tenure and right or maybe someone else did that and maybe that was the right choice for them but that doesn't mean it's the right choice for me so yeah yeah I had an interesting thing with a student who she's quite like me and believes what people say about uh-huh. stuff. And so she went on an REU and she was like, so do people take off the 4th of July? And people were like, oh, no, we research all the time, <laughs> like seven days a week. And, you know, so she went to work on the 4th of July. And of course, there is no not a single there. soul there. And it's just like, oh, oh, I see. Sometimes what people say is not necessarily what actually is happening so sure yeah it's good to remember yeah okay tell me you what are you working on I'm working on running into students in the wild by which I mean (laughs) off campus (laughs) (laughs) 
Oh, and yeah, totally. So most of the time, it's great. You know, you just say hello, see you tomorrow. Maybe we bond over whatever mutual activity we ran into each other doing. No problem. Um, but periodically, one or the other of us is caught off guard or is uncomfortable. It just gets a little awkward. Like, uh, how to make that normal? What can I do? I feel like it's my job as the professor in the relationship to smooth it out. Um, but I'm not really sure how to do that. Um, and and part of it is, you know, on campus, I'm in the role of a professor most of the time while I'm there, you know? And so you run into anyone you're expecting to run into someone, you fill the role of the professor, no problem. But then if you're at the grocery store or a restaurant or the pharmacy, um, I'm not in my professor role. And then, so, and if, if we have just a nice, pleasant interaction, which often can go down, then that's great. It's a nice, pleasant interaction. But then if it's just a little awkward, uh, yeah, just how to make it not awkward, how Dude. to... How oh, to you're make like it totally just asking close. the wrong <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing. My face is really red because I'm remembering some. Can I tell you? I have two yeah. terribly embarrassing okay, stories. Okay, great. That tell I'm us the stories. So, one was where I worked before. There was a pool on campus that was outdoors, and I was super pregnant with my youngest. And swimming is great when you're pregnant. And so, I had this really old maternity swimsuit that was just the worst and like so I was waddling out to the pool and there was like three students from my class and they're like oh doctor's on and I was like oh my god like really and just I was just like edging closer to the world like all I wanted to be was submerged so I wasn't just standing there uh-huh. outdoors with like a swimming hat on and like my giant pregnant self and so it was just really bad and recently I ran into a student in line at the same the grocery store the co-op uh-huh and I was like talking to her and like it was totally great but it was just there's always this added oh I thought I was just going to the store and now I'm kind of like interacting with the student and I ended up basically like stealing this chicken because I, I was talking to her somehow <laughs> instead of like putting the chicken on the like thing to go through I just picked it up and put it in my like bag and then the lady was like are you gonna pay for and I was like, oh, sure, yeah. Like, the student was just like, are you okay? And it was just oh so embarrassing. That's it was hilarious. so embarrassing. <laughs> and it was just, like, kind of frazzled. And so, yeah, I basically shoplifted a chicken. Sorry, that's why I've been chortling, because I was remembering that terrible experience. Oh, my goodness. So, Those yeah. are great stories. <laughs> well, I'm really glad I don't, you know, because I don't drink and... I can't imagine being at a bar and like having a great night out and running into a student. That would be, it would probably be worse than Stephen the chicken. <laughs> but so totally, yeah. totally, yeah. yeah. That's that's yeah. So yeah. I think my only advice is if you haven't stolen a chicken <laughs> or like exposed your pregnant body to like your class, you're probably doing better than me. So yeah. Oh man, I oh. mean, I think the the solution is, it it you know the more it happens, the more frequently the interactions will be on the normal positive side and you know <laughs> yeah um yeah <laughs> and I so. definitely have seen students too when they have seen my kids having epic meltdowns oh, where I'm literally course. just picking them up and carrying them out of the store just uh-huh. like you know it's so embarrassing but yeah yeah but yeah I mean I think I think it's it's another aspect of humanizing ourselves that they see us at the grocery store. I remember one of my students said, you shop at Winco too? And I was like, yeah, you know? So, um, so I think, first of all, we'll get better at it. And second of all, not that big a deal. And maybe it has that added benefit of the students seeing us doing normal people things like but it is weird sometimes that they're so we're like out shoplifting some groceries but um (laughs) it's weird sometimes because they're really embarrassed like I've definitely had that experience where they're like oh no and you're like okay don't worry I'm just gonna walk away it's okay we're not gonna talk because you might pass out because you seem very embarrassed yeah yeah and so yeah uh, so I, I I guess that's the main thing I want to work on is on the occasion when the student is uncomfortable I mean, I want to work on when I'm uncomfortable, too. But when when the student's uncomfortable, what can I do to ameliorate the uncomfort, you know? Yeah. And normally it's just like they were just going about their business, not in the role of a student, and suddenly they see their professor, and I understand that that would also be surprising. So, yeah. Yeah, it is weird because sometimes 
I forget the role that we have. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're just like, oh, I just see you four times a week in the classroom. Right. But then sometimes when they're so scandalized to see you out in the community, you're like, whoa, (laughs) I guess I really am this like other person. Right. Like, yeah, it's definitely interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, one of my colleagues will always say, "Professors are people too." Whenever we he put on our socks, people. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep, yep. Okay, well, yeah, I think um, this is something I think we could revisit over and over again because totally. it's such a big one. Totally. But yeah, cool. Thanks, Claire. Thank you, Ruth, and thank you, Ralph, as always. Thanks so much for joining us on the Professor Podcast with Ruth and Claire. We're delighted to have you as a listener and we would love to hear from you. And if you want to email us, our address is contactprofessorpodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear any of your suggestions for future shows or professor quotes that you might want to share with us, or even just things that have come up for you when you were listening to previous episodes. And if you've been enjoying the podcast, we would love if you would spread the word. So the best way to spread word is by telling people you know, if you think they should listen to it, or you can leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.